I'm just going to pray really quick, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into what the Lord has this morning. Father, we just, we thank you this morning that you woke us up, God. We thank you that today is the day that you have made, God, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it, Father. We thank you that you've made us in your image, that you've given us a purpose and a plan, God, that we are um, not here by chance, that we're not here just on a whim, God, but we're here with a, a divine purpose that you made us for, God. And I just pray this morning um, all of us uh, have a greater revelation of what our individual purposes this morning, God, that, that you give us greater revelation this morning as to how you're moving on us, no matter how underqualified or overqualified we are, God. I pray that we trust you this morning and see you as our supply and as our, as our provider. So we love you, God, this morning. We bless you, and we thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Morning, everybody. Um, I am super excited this morning. Um, pretty funny. You're not going to have, unfortunately, there's not going to be any notes up on on the, the prompt, if, if that's what you're looking for, I'm really sorry. You can blame it on Pastor Jeff. Uh, he, he, told me, he told me on Thursday that he wanted me to share this morning, so um, not a lot of time to get notes up on, on the screen for you guys, um, but, uh, but really excited. It's actually more comfortable for me. In Africa, we don't have screens and prompts with notes, and so I'm actually not used to ministering in that capacity, and so this is actually much more uh, freeing for me. So... Um, you know, when we launched, I, I want to encourage you guys this morning from some stories that we've walked through and things that we've had to kind of apply our faith to in our journey. Um, you know, Kelly, it's funny, Pastor Jeff talked about how, you know, she came to faith while being here at the bridge. She was actually on the uh, Ensenada, Mexico mission trip building houses when, when she actually surrendered her life to Jesus. And, um, you know, when, when she came to Africa, she was only six months saved. And, um, you know, we got married in March of 2018 and launched out to where we are now in uh, August or September of 2018. And so she's like six months saved. We're like a brand new married couple. Um, you know, I, I don't have a degree, and I'm, I'm not boasting in this. I'm not saying that it's, uh, there's anything to be proud of that I don't, but I, I, don't, I don't have a theology degree. I'm not a pastor's kid. I'm not a missions kid. I'm not a certified builder. I'm not a certified plumber. I'm not a social worker, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor. I mean, literally anything that you would think if you came to me and said, why should you be a missionary? I literally have nothing to give you. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> Hope I don't let you down on that. Um, but what I do have is a very vibrant relationship with Jesus. And he, he, he touched my heart. Yeah, we can give Jesus. Um, I, I didn't really grow up in a... Um, a heavily churched home, um, have Catholic roots in our background, and um, I actually, you know, when I, from the time I was 16 to the time I was 21, I was actually an atheist, um, and in the pit of a lot of mess, and you wouldn't be able to tell if you looked at me now, maybe, but um, God, God restored me from a lot, and, and the beautiful thing is when, when we have that reality change in our hearts, it, it lights a fire, you know, we realize that God is actually a powerful God that can do something, that he's not, just, he's not just a God that we read about or talk about on Sunday, but he's a God that actually changes our life day by day. And that's beautiful, and that's so empowering. And so that's what I have. And um, I, I love that the Bible helps me feel confident because I read in Acts, if you're not familiar with the story, there's a, a scripture in Acts, I believe it's chapter four, where uh, John and Peter were put before the Sanhedrin to to give an account for why they were preaching after Jesus' death and burial and ascension to heaven. And uh, they, they get up in front of the Sanhedrin, which are the religious leaders, all the people, you know, that um, thought they knew the kingdom, and they start to declare the truth of Jesus. And at the end of it, they, they ordered them to be whipped and sent away, and, and they looked at each other. The Sanhedrin looked at each other and said, these are unskilled and uneducated people. <laughs> but they took note, for they had been with Jesus. Hallelujah. And so listen, uh, we, we get launched out to this place. We get 1,200 acres of land given to us. And there's no reason to think that Kelly and I would have any ability to see any fruit or any results, right? There's nothing I could look at and go, yep, this is why we're going to be successful. I was a missionary kid. My, my parents are missionaries, so I know what it's like. Or I've, I've been in the church for 20 years. I know how ministry goes. I, can, I got this. We got this. No problem. Or, hey, I, you know, we got to do a lot of building. I got certificates, man. I'm, I'm good. I've, I've, been, I've been in the building world for 25 years. I'm ready to go. None of that. But what we did have is assurance, right? 
Because if God is going to open a door for us, then it means he's going to provide for us. I, had, I like one-line like one truths. I like little like, snippet truths because they're easy for me to remember. And I had a friend, actually, Paul E.G., the one that Kelly mentioned. He, uh, he said, if God provides the vision, then he'll always provide the provision. And I liked it, and I liked it. And that, you can look at that as financial, you can look at that, but you can also look at that as like st divine strategy and purpose, right? And, and in a reality of how to do what God's called you to do. But there comes a decision. We all come to a, a, a cross in the road or a, or a fork in the road that we've got to make a decision. And I think for some of us, it's a daily decision. I think, I think actually, and often in our lives, this is a decision that we have to make every day. It's not just a one-time decision. It's a, every single day we have to choose to say, I'm going to trust in God as my supply and not myself. Hallelujah. It would, be, it would be a shame if I went to the mission field and relied on myself to do the work. I'm actually thankful that I didn't have that um, temptation, that I was forced to say, God, I don't know how we're gonna do this. I don't know what this looks like, but I know that you opened a door and I trust you and the Bible says that you are good and I've seen it in my life. I've tasted your goodness and I know that you'll provide. And so we just did. We just, we just went. And it's, the ministry started with Nothing, nothing fun to talk about. It literally started, our, the whole ministry started around a campfire at 5.30 in the morning with me and four other people. There's no buildings. There, it's, we're, we're living in tents. It's, the fire is literally under, we have wooden poles in the ground with a tarp over top of it. And we're sitting around a campfire with four people. You start questioning, God, what, what are we even doing what is, is this really what you called me to Africa for? A little four-person Bible study around a fire under a tarp? I could have did this in America. But then we were faithful. And we trusted that God had a plan and a purpose and that there was a reason we were there. And so five became 10 and 10 became 20. 20 became 50. At one point we had 100 people gathering six days a week to sit around and hear the word of the Lord and be encouraged in prayer. 100 people, six days a week. I mean, Pastor Jeff, six, you have a message six days a week. Multiple hours a morning. It wasn't like a little 15-minute devotion, a little, you know, thing you get offline, you just pep talk, and then everybody gets on their day. It was like, this is like real looking people in the eye and realizing pain and hurt in their eyes and seeing something going on and ministering to that and, and calling out truth that, that they don't even see in themselves day by day. That's a challenge. Listen, there were mornings I woke up, there were mornings I woke up and I was sure I had nothing to offer. There's one, there's one story specifically. We were, um, we get big rainy seasons where we are and it uh, rains from October until end of March, maybe into April. And um, it was probably August at this point. We're not expecting rains. We're living in a tent. And the tents that we had aren't waterproof. They're like these safari tents with these mesh tops that allow nice airflow, which is great in the summer when it's hot. <laughs> Terrible in the rain. <laughs> So it's August, though, so we don't think the rains are coming yet, so we, we don't have anything prepared. And one night in the middle of August, it, it, God just decides to send a torrential downpour in the middle of nowhere. And so our, our tent is getting flooded. We got a six-month-old baby. Uh, it, literally underneath the tent was like a waterbed. You could literally like touch underneath, and it was like water was flowing underneath our, our tent. And so we were up to like, I don't know, 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning trying to like... I had to go outside and get the top covered and get everything dried off. And, you know, I, I remember I laid down in bed at like 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I had to be up in like 35 minutes to start making tea and bread and for all the guys that are coming, you know, the people that are coming at the time. Because by that time we had, I think, 50 people coming in the morning. And I just remember I laid down and I said, Lord, I have nothing. I don't, this is like, I'm going to get 30 minutes of sleep and you want me to... to, to have something for your people. And God spoke a word to my heart that like wrecked me. He said, my people receive my blessings as curses. 
Because in Africa, for a lot of these people, rain are, is a beautiful thing, right? When rain is a, a, a or when water is a, a resource that's scarce, rain's a beautiful thing. But for me, in my Western mindset, it didn't fit my schedule. <laughs> Anybody can relate to that? <laughs> that didn't fit my schedule. You know what we did that morning when I got out there? That's all we ministered on. That's all we talked about. Guys, the Lord, I think the Lord just wants us to look at our lives and say, what areas of our life are we receiving as a curse when really it's meant to be a blessing? Right? And so what I'm, what I'm trying to encourage you in this morning and share with you this morning and reveal to you this morning is that God has a purpose and a plan for all of us. It may not be that you go all the way to Africa. It may not be that you end up in the middle of the bush of Africa and Zambia with us. Maybe it does. A little extra pause there really quick. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what your version of this is. It can be really simple stuff, guys. It can be just showing up to a Bible study. Like, like, like what it looks like to step out and trust God can look different for everybody, and there's no, there's no judgment. This isn't a, um, we're not, it's not, um, there's no qualification for what makes it considered stepping out. It's whatever is your next step is your next step, and that's beautiful. Amen? But you got to be faithful in it, whatever it is. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. <laughs> without faith, it's impossible to please God. We, one thing that I'm very keenly aware of, though, is that we need to be careful that what we are deciding to go out with. Amen? Meaning, meaning, this, this whole series that you guys are in, Je Jesus-centered relationships, meaning we're centering everything that we do in our life around Jesus. And what we understand about Jesus and what we understand about what he did for us and now how he lives with us radically changes what that looks like. And depending on your level of um, reception to the truths that are found in the Scripture is going to dictate how, how, easily, how easy it is for you to step out and live a Jesus-centered life. Amen? The Bible says some radical stuff. <laughs> I, was, I was just at a church the other day, and um, we, I don't think we realize that we, we believe really crazy things. <laughs> Sometimes. Depending on, depending on, you know, some, some of you may be new in the room. Thank you for coming. Um, some of you may have been in, in church for 30 years, and you're like talking about, yeah, Jesus died and resurrected. It's like, bro, you're saying Jesus died and resurrected. Like, isn't that crazy? Like, in a, like, like I'm not saying it like a disbelief way. I'm saying like a, do we recognize what we're saying we believe? Or are we just, are we just passing over it like it's no big deal? Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus died and resurrected. Bro. And the reason I think that's so important to, to, to talk about for just a second, especially as Easter's coming up, is because if, if, if we're having trouble trusting or, or, or really allowing our heart to meditate on the fact that Jesus really did die for you and that he was buried for three days and then afterwards he rose from the dead and then ascended into heaven in his seat at the right hand of the Father on your behalf and poured out the Holy Spirit so that you could live a victorious life, if you don't have that settled deeply, rooted deeply on the inside of you, your, your Christianity is just a self-help situation. You're just coming to church for behavior modification. You're not coming with a transformed life realizing that Jesus, God wants to miraculously change your life. The Bible says anyone who is in Christ, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, anyone who is in, who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Hallelujah. This isn't, this isn't a let's put band-aids all over your problems. This is a transformed life we're talking about. This is a life that took me, this atheist kid who was living in drugs and alcohol and problems and transformed him and turned him into a person who actually cares a little bit about other people now. <laughs> And I say a little bit because I'm always, I'm always convicted to do it more. 
Somebody told me one time, they said, the closer you get to the sun, the hotter it feels. The closer you get to God, the more you realize areas of your life that God wants to move in. And that's a beautiful process. That shouldn't be a discouraging process. Like, oh, dang it, another thing I suck at. No. <laughs> but that's what we do. That's what we do. Instead, it should be, God, thank you so much that there's a, I thought my relationship with you was so good, and it can get better? What? Are you serious? Amen? Faith can be fun, guys. Faith can be fun. It doesn't have to be this thing where life becomes boring and bland and you, you know, lose all color in your life because now you just got to stay on the straight and narrow with Jesus. I've never had a more vibrant life than I have being on the mission field, serving Jesus with everything. I've never been more fulfilled and more full of faith and excited and passionate than I have in this season of my life. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wouldn't trade it for the world. But it's going to require something. Salvation requires nothing. You, you being taken out of darkness and moving into light, it just all, it, the only thing is required is you just accept it. You don't have to do anything. But if you want to begin to live out the kingdom of heaven on earth, it's going to require something. If you want to experience your salvation and not just wait until that day comes when you get called back to heaven and you punch your ticket which is ne was never meant to be salvation, by the way. Salvation was never meant to be something that we waited for. All right, well, I got my ticket punched. I'm good to go. I prayed the prayer, brother. See you on the other side. That was never meant to be salvation. How did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think, uh, I think our friend Cecil Ramos has a, in, in, uh, in Thailand as it is in heaven or something like that, right? I love that. Because that's supposed to be our experience. Our experience is supposed to be heaven on earth. Our experience is supposed to be actually engaging with God and experiencing a transformed life. He's not, he, we're not, he's not into behavior modification and sin control. He's into a relationship. Hallelujah. We don't just have to come to church on Sunday because we know it's a good thing to do. We can come to church on Sunday because we're awakened to a reality. And maybe that's not you. Listen, maybe you're here this morning and you, you don't even know why you're here. You just came or maybe your wife forces you to come or, you know, your husband, I don't know, maybe it could be the other way around. I guess your husband could force you to come or whatever. That's okay. There's no judgment. God still loves you so much. It doesn't matter why you're here. <laughs> His love doesn't change. He's not like us. He's not like a shifting shadow. He's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. But know that coming to church can be so much more than what your experience has been. Coming to church can be real. <laughs> I want to read a scripture for you. Turn with me to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. I think this, this Bible is a NIV. Don't judge me. I don't know if you... <laughs> it's a joke. <clears throat> okay, anyways. <laughs> I'm going to read it now. Um, okay, such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we claim, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. I just think it's important to 
to read scripture as I'm sharing with you what God's put on my heart. And this scripture has protected me, kept me, um, gave me confidence in seasons when I should have none. And my prayer is that it would be for you too. That you realize that God has made you competent in whatever he is asking you to do. Because his spirit has come to live on the inside of you. You know what the Bible says that every, God has given you, past tense. If you're in Christ, right? Born again, faithful believer. God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. Everything you need. But then I'll ask you, I'll say, hey, uh, do you want to lead a, a devotion next week? Oh, you know, brother, I don't really know the Bible so well. He has given you everything you need for life and godliness. Meaning, we need to, we need to stop turning into ourselves to look at ourselves for our supply. I've actually, I've actually, it's probably why I accepted preaching this Sunday when he, when he texted me halfway through Thursday. <laughs> We're driving down from Ukiah. <laughs> I've actually decided, I've made a thing in my life where I'm like, it's kind of like that movie um, uh, with Jim Carrey. What's that? Is it Ye Yes, man. I'm just going to say Yes. Not really that, but it's more so like if I don't feel like I'm ready for something, I'm going to say yes. Why? Because I want to create opportunities for God to show up. I want to stop being able to like take success in something that happens well and, and, and let myself receive credit for it. I want to put myself in situations where God has to move because he's faithful and he does it every time. In the six years I've been in Zambia, I've never seen him not show up. Never once. Now, does that, I want to be careful that we don't hear that wrong. Because I know, I know there's, um, there can be pain in the room and there can be situations that you've been believing God for that you don't feel like you got an answered prayer. So I want to be careful. I don't mean that we didn't have difficult situations. I don't mean that everything has always gone perfectly well. We've had malaria a bunch of times. We've been stung by scorpions. Our kids have had rashes that we don't even understand what they are. I mean, it, it, the list goes, I mean, we've, we've lost loved friends over there. I mean, we've had ministry partners who've had miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage. Kelly and I had a miscarriage our first six months in the field. Like, it's, it's not been short of difficulties. But my experience will never speak louder than truth. My experience will never speak louder than truth. So I don't say everything, God's always answered my prayer because everything's worked out. I say God's always answered my prayer because I know he's faithful. So then I can put a smile on my face and know that he's good, not because I'm faking it and trying to like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm the missionary, so I gotta have a smile on my face. No, 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 I literally mean it. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in people having an encounter with the Lord. I'm really interested in that. I'm not really interested in a lot of head knowledge. Not that it's not valuable. It's very valuable. Um, it's very helpful. There's a lot of times in your life where head knowledge is going to help you. But I'm, I'm much more... Um, interested in you guys sitting in this room having an encounter with the Lord. I pray that he's speaking to your heart right now. I really do. I pray that he's moving on your heart, whether that's moving you into a relationship with him because you've been running, or whether, or whether you've been a good and faithful servant and you just need to hear that there's more for you. Your journey's not done yet. Your race isn't over. Hallelujah. I read a, um, a, uh, a research 
a poll, or I don't know what you'd call it, I guess, but uh, some kind of a research thing that came out that, that looked at, tried to put a value on what your most impactful years of your life are. And you'd be surprised. If you had to guess, what, what would be the best decade of your life? Some would probably say 20 to 30, maybe. Maybe 30 to 40, right? Maybe 40 to 50. It said the most impactful decade of your life was 60 to 70. No, yeah, 60 to 70. Your second most impactful decade of your life. Come on, let's go. <laughs> That's why I'm bringing it up. I want all my, I want all my, my uh, elders in the faith who've, who've carried the torch for years to be encouraged. Heck yeah, let's go. Second most impactful, 70 to 80. <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you, I, gotta, I love that I'm getting, I don't know who's saying it. I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that somebody that's older, they got more energy than all you young people in here. Come on. <laughs> this is great. And, and the way they came up with that information, the third, oh, real quick, I'll share. The third is, is uh, 50 to 60. Those are your three most impactful decades. And what they did is they looked at, they looked at Nobel Peace Prize winners. They looked at presidents of nations and, and people, leaders of countries. They looked at um, uh, CEOs of organizations. They looked at uh, leading uh, men of faith for different religious beliefs and what their ages were. And after analyzing all that, they came out with those three as your most impactful years. Meaning, you guys are just getting started. Hallelujah. I want everybody in this room to feel encouraged today. I want everybody in this room to be stirred to step into something. To step into a Jesus-centered way of living that touches every area of your life. That's not just reserved for Sunday from 9 to 10.30 or whatever time we're going to get out of here. If I'm an African preacher, I'm going to make it run for a little longer. <laughs> I'm not used to a, a timing screen telling me to stop talking, you know, so we're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> I don't want to... Um, it's so interesting. I love the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I, I've, had, I've had the privilege to preach all across the country over the years, um, being a missionary. And it's always interesting how a, a service takes its own identity. You know, you have ideas coming into what a service is going to look like, and then you get into it, and you're like, wow, Holy Spirit, like, this is what you want to do. You can do great things for God. You can do great things for God. I promise you, he can, he can move and do things you never thought possible. I see somebody sitting here right now that's got a story that's impossible. You know, you know what the definition of insanity is? Come on, somebody tell me it. Shout it out like that guy in the back. Come on. It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And then we're wondering why we're not seeing God move radically in our faith. And this can apply whether, whether you're just coming to church today for the first time or you've been a priester, or you've been just a Sunday goer or just showing up because you know it's the right thing to do. Or it can apply, you could be a senior pastor, you could be a missionary. And the same thing can apply. If we're not careful, we get caught in a routine of just showing up. When the whole time God was calling you into him, calling you into a divine strategy, a divine purpose, a reality that, that goes beyond our understanding. But we get so caught up in our own lives and in our own things we have going on. The greatest tragedy in the world is that men and women wake up every day and live for themselves. That's the greatest tragedy in the world. Because in that place, all kinds of sin can take over. We wake up every day and we always think, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? Where am I going to go to work? What kind of fun toy am I going to buy? What activity am I going to do? What are my kids going to do? Me, 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 me.
And listen, you can live there and have this, and, 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 and have given your life to Jesus in the sense of saying that you believe in his death for your life and that you want to go to heaven, and I believe we'll see you there. But that reality is never going to lead to a passionate faith experience on the earth. That's going to lead to like, well, I don't know if he answers prayer, brother. I, um, I want everybody to have my experience. And I'm not saying that like a, like a proud way, like my experience is the ultimate experience. I'm just saying I know so many people who aren't having the same experience, that are living day to day wondering if God cares, wondering if God sees them, wondering if they have any purpose, wondering if they have any value. And I want people to wake up every day knowing that he's good. You're not just part of a crowd. <laughs> you know what the mystery of the gospel is? Mystery is not a mystery of the gospel is not a ticket punch to heaven. Mystery of the gospel is not tithing and showing up to church every Sunday. The mystery of the gospel is not missionary work or great kids programs. The mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Jesus deemed you worthy to come and live on the inside of you and, and make his life your life so that you didn't have to be a victim to what happened to you, but you could live according to what he has for you. Amen? And I pray that's good news this morning for you. Don't, don't, miss, don't miss this morning um, and, and not make a step. What I want to challenge everybody this morning to do is to, to, to make a faith step. Don't just hear words this morning. I think God's probably been stirring something in your heart. I want you to do something with it. I want you to take an action step. I want you to, if, if, if it was to jump into a serve team, I want, you to, I want you to do it before you leave today. That's my encouragement to you. As a, as, a, as a person who's walked the journey of faith for about 12 years now, I know that if I put it off, probably not gonna do it. So if you felt led to do something, join a, join a men's group, join a women's group, pray for someone, um, uh, help someone, d do a mission trip, whatever it is. Don't leave before you make an action step towards it. If you got somebody in your heart, shoot them a text before you leave this service. Call them before you leave this service. When you get in your car, call them. Amen? Can, um, can I everybody stand to your feet if, it's, uh, if that's okay? If you're able to, if you're not able to, it's okay. could just put your, put your hand over your heart. I'm just confident that God wants to move in our hearts this morning. I'm just confident that God um, doesn't, doesn't base what happens off of us. It, he bases what happens off of his desires and his purposes and that we just get to step into it by faith and live a radical life surrendered unto him. And if you're doubting this morning, I pray right now in Jesus' name that there's peace in your heart that your mind is quieted, that you're not looking at yourself and trying to figure out whether or not these words make sense to you or whether or not they're real for you or whether or not Jesus is enough to actually change your life and maybe you're just too bad to be changed. Father, we thank you this, this morning. We thank you that your life is in us, God. We thank you that, that you've made us like you, God, that you have a desire to make us more like you day by day. Father, I thank you right now for the strength that your, 
you're revealing to your people in this building this morning, God, a strength to step out and be courageous, to realize that Christianity was never meant to be a life received, but it was meant to be a life given. God, that we would be challenged to step out by faith and live Jesus-centered lives that look like you. God, that we would remove any excuses that would hinder us from experiencing everything you have for us. Father, we love you this morning. We bless you this morning, God. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I think Pastor Jeff's going to come up. Maybe Kelly. Um, Just as we're closing, uh, I know there's some things to share, and then we're going to go to worship. Um, Just continue to press in. Amen? Just continue to to let God stir in your heart and reveal this to you and and, and show you this reality of, of what he has for you and what he wants to do with your life. You're not too small. You're not too young. You're not too old. You are exactly what God has planned. You are not a B team. You're not the bench player who's getting called into the game because there's nobody else to play. You're his A team. And I know that sounds ridiculously stupid, but it's just what he did. (laughs) And that's the beauty of it. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Brad and Kelly. Um, We're going to go into our prayer moment uh, right now. Um, You can stay standing if if, if that's all right. and uh, yeah, it was um, it, it was actually Thursday that that God started, um, you know, talking to my heart and and uh, putting this idea on my heart to have uh, you guys come and they were gonna come and just do you know a five minute little update on the ministry and and I felt like uh, God was saying let's let's have you guys share the whole time and and so if. If uh, and then you said partway through the day, I think it was like six o'clock in the evening on Thursday <laughs> that I actually told you. But if, if you're feeling right now, you know, the Holy Spirit tapping you and encouraging you in some way, challenging you in some way, you know, just know that He's orchestrated all of this today. Um, that He really did have you in mind, um, knew you'd be here, and knew that. Uh, he wanted to speak to you, knew he wanted to challenge you maybe in some new way and, and stretch you, you know, somewhere in your faith to really live a Jesus-centered life. What a great challenge today. Maybe it's uh, someone that's watching on the live stream, um, and uh, you're in this too. God's thinking of you as well. Um, so as we go to our prayer time today, um, We definitely want to pray for uh, Brad and Kelly and the girls, but, um, but also just uh, each one of us. I'm going to just pray for each one of us and whatever God is doing, um, that, uh, that we would have faith to respond. Um, that's all. That's all we need to do is just have faith to respond, to take those steps. Like Brad was saying, what's, what's the next step, right? Whether you're uh, a pre-Christian right now, and God says, come on into the family of God, right? Or if you've been like some of those people that are in the prime of their lives, right? The 70s to 80s, I think you were saying, you know, um, there's still another step for you as well. So, um, yeah, let's pray. God, you are just so real to us. You are with us. We sense your presence. I I thank you that you're just so tangible right now and that we, we feel your presence. We feel you tapping our hearts and minds, encouraging us and challenging us. Thank you that our friends would be here from Zambia to be used by you today um, to to touch our hearts and to challenge us. So I just want to pray for, firstly, for the for the person that might be here today, unsure of 
where they're really at in their relationship with you because maybe it hasn't felt real like Brad was talking about. It hasn't felt vibrant. Maybe we're wondering if, if we even have a true relationship with you. That as we've been hearing about the Holy Spirit of God, God's Spirit actually dwelling inside of us and living living life through us, we're not sure that that's happening. So I pray, Father, that you would draw that person in right now by faith, that they would receive the good news of Jesus for themselves, that they would recognize um, that they, like all of us, are sinners and need a Savior, and that you provided that. And that if we just reach out in faith and say we believe that, ask forgiveness of our sins, and invite you to come into our lives, you will make us a new creature, a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So God, would you, through the power that raised Jesus from the dead, would you bring people from darkness to life today? And I also, we would pray for those that, uh, that already have secured that relationship with you. But maybe we have just kind of been in uh, maybe a dry period with you. Maybe we've just been going through the motions. Perhaps our lives have been virtually indistinguishable from those lives that don't have Jesus in us. Maybe we haven't truly been living Jesus-centered lives, but more, as Brad was describing, me-centered lives. God, would you save us from ourselves? Would you take us from that place and let those dry bones come to life again? Would you begin to orientate our lives completely around you and your truth? Would we wake up tomorrow morning wondering how we can serve you and who we can love on your behalf rather than thinking of ourselves? And then, God, just for all of us who, who know you and and you're making that invitation as Brad was speaking. You were speaking to our hearts and to our minds, and there's that specific invitation that you're putting on our hearts. Different for each one of us. But whatever that was, God, don't let that go away from our hearts and minds until we have received that and, and taken that action step. That by faith we would say yes, God, to what you're calling us to. Yes, God, may I be found faithful. I'm coming off of the bench and I'm coming into the game. pray for each one of us and each one of us as individuals, each one of us as families, that we would be leading the way to see you create in this city neighborhoods that are full of families that are centered on Jesus and actively living out the gospel. God, we lift up the Russ family to you. Thank you for what, for what you did in Kelly's life on a missions trip, just like we've got a, about 80 
of our folks on a missions trip this weekend and the same, the same one to Mexico and what you did to transform her life and how you've led her and guided her to really go to the ends of the earth to share your goodness and your truth and how you've grabbed hold of Brad's life from a life early on that looked like it was headed in all the wrong directions and boy you just chose him out of that and you've brought them together with their two beautiful girls to a place that is just so different from what we know here but it's so obvious that you have a plan and that you have been providing all that they need and I pray that you would continue to do that as as the ministry grows as the impact grows as the needs grow may there be people in this place right now that you would tap on the shoulder to to help meet those needs that financially some might be able to support on a monthly basis what you're doing there that through prayer we could support every day what you're doing there so may they be encouraged during this furlough time of being back here in North America may they be encouraged and and uh, and prepared for heading back and continuing uh, to pursue what you've called them to thank you that you've used them powerfully today among us we prayed before the service started that uh, that Jesus you would this stage would be yours that the lights would shine bright on you that your name would be high and lifted up and you have done it you have glorified yourself today and we praise you and we thank you for that we love you so much don't stop God don't stop what you're doing don't stop what you're doing among us here at the bridge and in other churches in Bakersfield don't stop what you're doing in Zambia among the church there don't stop God and continue to use us we love you so much in Jesus name and all God's people said Amen. Amen. Amen.